Today is also a treat. Uh, it, it's going to be John Sitter, who's going to answer the question, what's posterity ever done for us, literature and the future? Uh, John asked me not to mention uh, his uh, upbringing in a log cabin nor his time with the Foreign Legion. Um, but let me say one thing that I uh, hadn't spotted until he just pointed it out to me, that he has slightly divided loyalties today because his very first faculty position was as an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, <laughs> He came to Notre Dame uh, from Emory, uh, and he is here, the Mary Lee Duda Professor of Literature. He was, for uh, three years, cha chair of the Notre Dame English Department. His own work has been primarily, or in 18th century studies, uh, he was the author of, sorry, I'm turning over my pages, uh, the Cambridge Introduction to 18th Century Poetry, and edited the Cambridge Companion to 18th Century Poetry, and a superb book called Arguments of Augustan Wit. Uh, published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, he's also extended his interests in, in different directions, and he's very much involved in the sustainability minor uh, here at Notre Dame, and is, I always think, our humanities spokesman on all matters green. Uh, but his topic today uh, is the future and us. Let me hand over to John Sitter. Thank you, Peter, and thank you all for coming on this uh, beautiful day. Um, <clears throat> it is very good to be here and to be able to uh, speak outside the classroom, much as I love teaching Notre Dame students. The um, picture here is one that some of you may recognize. This is the Chicago landmark. It is the dome, uh, the beautiful Tiffany Dome of the Cultural Center. Uh, originally the library in Chicago, and uh, it has, as you see in more detail in just a moment, an inscription from the works of Joseph Addison, an 18th century writer, that first uh, led me to that building. Uh, and this is the, <clears throat> we're going to come back to Addison, but this is a uh, remark that is very apropos for our purposes too. The books are legacies for posterity. The, uh, as I said, it's good to be teaching outside the classroom uh, in this relaxed setting. Inside the classroom, sometimes one hears this question, uh, is this going to be on the midterm? The answer is no. Uh, I'll explain my title in a few minutes, but first I'll try to explain myself, or rather my presence. How, that is how it comes to pass that a dusty 18th century scholar should also be conducting research and teaching in the emergent emerging field uh, loosely called sustainability studies. And while, as I understand it, these Saturday scholar talks are meant to be more about scholarship than about curricular developments, I imagine that the connection many of you have to Notre Dame will um, give you some interest in the fact that we now have uh, several courses grouped under the large umbrella or perhaps a big tent of sustainability, and that we have an interdisciplinary minor in the subject that Peter alluded to, uh, currently enrolling over 40 students. This minor is located administratively in the College of Science, but it has been supported also by the Dean of Arts and Letters and by many of the faculty of Arts and Letters, uh, ranging from theology to history to uh, sociology, political science, and even English. Its students hail from every college in the university, including engineering, business, and architecture. But what is sustainability studies? It, one brief way of thinking about it would be it's conceptualizing, conceptualizing and finding ideas and practices that are likely to last. The briefest definition I know is by way of antonym, sustainability is the opposite of collapse. One observer has said that whether we live in a sustainable era is uncertain, but it's clear we live in an era of verbal sustainability because the term is everywhere. And according to this political observer, can only get worse so that all language will consist of the term sustainable and sustainability before long. Uh, sustainability is somewhat wield unwieldy as an abstraction, so it tends to get used more as an adjective 
one of the most, uh, usually attached to development, one of the most quoted formulations is this, which goes back to the UN Commission in 1987 in what is usually called shorthand the Brundtland Report after the chairwoman of that committee. And you see that it invokes the idea of meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet theirs. It leaves, of course, a lot of things to be negotiated or debated, like what are legitimate needs and uh, what does it mean to uh, uh, leave future generations enough to do what they need to do. But uh, it's a, a good start. Sustainability is about transmission of things of value to future generations. And in that way, it's like one hopes, it's like teaching. And it's like parenting. And like parenting, it is sometimes disciplinary and often interdisciplinary, uh, requiring that we learn things we never expected to need to master taking us continually beyond our comfort zones. This is why I, I like to brag to my students at the end of the sustainability course, the introductory course that I help teach, that I'm the most generous teacher they've ever had. And I explained that uh, indeed all their teachers at Notre Dame are willing to share with them some of what they know. And some of their teachers are willing to share all of what they know, but I go further day after day and share more than I know. Um, but sustainability studies like the liberal arts generally aims at a deeper understanding of ourselves in our world. Traditionally, there is a recognized division of knowledge separating the humanities and the natural sciences. But many would say that the traditional division doesn't quite work anymore now that we're in the so-called Anthropocene era. This question posed here, are we now living in the Anthropocene, was answered <laughs> and The Economist, and has been answered by many other publications affirmatively. What this name, this term names, is the fact that the human mark is everywhere in nature now, and the old division, therefore, this is not what most people mean when they invoke that, but what I and others would take that to mean, is that the division between humanities and sciences doesn't work because the division between the made world the world of human culture, institutions, artifacts, that is a traditional area of study for the humanities. The division between that world and the found or natural world, the world without human presence, that no longer exists because our presence is in fact uh, everywhere. We think usually of liberal arts education as increasing self-understanding. The relevant point here is that the blurring or interpenetration of scientific and humanistic study now leads, whether we want this to be the case or not, to new ways of understanding where we are. Uh, understanding we are where we are in space, you've probably seen pictures like this before. Uh, we have obviously been decentered for a couple of centuries and we've kind of gotten used to that idea. And where we are in time. Um, and this is a geological chart of, of eras, uh, with the most recent at the top. And the Holocene is the, roughly the last 10, 11,000 years of a kind of sameness, is what that, that uh, name suggests. The period in which civilization as we know it uh, has developed and uh, evolved. And the, that's just a little clearer, I hope. Um, the so-called Anthropocene epoch would be new. It's not, not many times that people have lived at what might be the beginning of a new epoch. This point is still being debated by the geologists, specifically the stratigraphers, people work in layers, and they're supposed to make a formal pronouncement in 2016 about whether this, in fact, is going to be an official designation, but the designation has really caught on, and it does indicate just what I've said, the recognition of increasing human influence on the environment everywhere from here to Antarctica and so on. Um, now, the argument would be then that to do what Socrates and other philosophers of his era recommended to know ourselves requires something different now than it used to. And you can see this. This is Holmes Rolston, a envir noted environmental philosopher, uh, who says we have to become wiser than Socrates. 
that's an outrageous statement. Um, what, what in the world can he mean by that? Well, what he means essentially is that an ethical system for our day has to be able to take the natural environment as seriously as traditional ethics have taken our relations to each other. You still might be wondering why a humanist is involved in sustainability studies, and one reason is conceptual, I think, and I'm of course not the only humanist uh, so involved. Uh, <clears throat> it's conceptual because sustainability is not just about getting the science right or the technology right. It's about meanings and values, and that fact derives from the prior fact that sustain is a transitive verb. It requires an object. Sustain what? And as soon as we pose that question, we're into questions of why and evaluation, how we would make those decisions circumspectly and so on. And once you've introduced what and how and why, you've let the humanists in and there goes the neighborhood. Still, not everybody agrees that sustainability studies belongs with the liberal arts. <clears throat> Some fear making the liberal arts overly topical or trendy, letting the urgent, as they might say in business circles, distract us from the important. And some worry that we might be mixing our concerns as ordinary citizens with our proper concerns as scholars and teachers. There, there is a lot to discuss there, I think, in that different, uh, those opposing views. But today I'll just say that I don't think that excluding the urgent is a view we can afford these days, uh, <clears throat> that in the case of climate and the rest of our environmental crisis, urgency and importance really are the same. But I also don't think it's simply the humanist concerns as citizens that brings them to the environment. The environment, as it were, comes to us as scholars and intellectuals. The philosopher Dale Jameson concludes his powerful uh, recent book with the statement that we'll need to adapt to a new world culturally as well as physically. It's the last part there that I want to emphasize that with all these changes, it will become increasingly difficult to relate to the old stories and tales. I want to take up that point and uh, about our relation to those stories and tales, and I'll broaden it somewhat to text of the kind that we study in the humanities. I want to take that up somewhat autobiographically, if you bear with me for a moment, as a way of explaining what brings me here. And uh, the autobiography concerns teaching, and specifically teaching one of my favorite poems, Gerard Manley Hopkins' great sonnet, God's Grandeur. Uh, I'll take a minute and read this here, and if those of you unfamiliar with uh, Hopkins will find this, uh, some of the words or the uses a little strange, so let me just say a couple things in advance. The uh, ooze of oil in the third line is, this is olive oil, he's talking about, not petroleum. And that fourth line, wreck is an old word for something like reckon or acknowledge, and to wreck his rod would mean to acknowledge God's authority uh, or power. And... Uh, in the bottom part, in the sestet, the last six lines, the word for is really, really means something like uh, in spite of. Okay? The world is charged with the grandeur of God. <clears throat> it will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things, and though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breasts and with ah, bright wings. <clears throat> Some time ago, maybe about 20 years ago now, I realized that I'd begun to read that poem, or at least part of that poem, differently. 
that what I had learned about shrinking aquifers and other environmental strains gave me a different reaction to the assertion of nature's inexhaustibility, a different reaction to it than Hopkins would have had or could have intended. The concern that dearest freshness, deep down things, which I think means both in deep down things and, and uh, deep down in things, that it might not keep coming back as morning follows night. And that recognition, the recognition of that possibility, gave the poem for me, it still does, a melancholy, uh, even elegiac quality, which again, I would not contend was part of Hopkins' intention. My point here is simply that environmental concerns might become important for a teacher of literature, not simply personally, because he or she also happens to be a citizen or a parent or a grandparent, but professionally, vocationally, because environmental concerns affect the very things we teach. Now, the concept of posterity is especially interesting to some of us 18th century scholars because the word and idea were undergoing important developments in our period. Through the Renaissance and up to about 1700, the dominant meaning of the word posterity was one's personal descendants, so that to speak of your posterity would mean your children and grandchildren and so on. This meaning persists, and it's still what the authors of the US Constitution probably meant by their determination to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. But it's also during the 18th century <clears throat> coming more and more to mean future generations generally. All of those as yet unborn people one does not know and perhaps never will know. Well, finally I come to my title. You've probably recognized its Marxist origin. That is, it's based on a joke attributed to Groucho Marx. <laughs> Why should I care about posterity? What's posterity ever done for me? Actually, the joke is at least a couple of centuries older than Groucho, and it goes back, probably further than this, but it goes back at least to Addison. Joseph Addison um, wrote uh, many things, but he was the, uh, the main force behind The Spectator, arguably the first good daily newspaper, six days a week in early 18th century England. That's kind of what a broad sheet would look like. That's not the issue I'm going to quote from, but rather this one from uh, 1714. And he tells this story in the middle of what we today would call a column. He was basically you know, a columnist. Um, <clears throat> that when it comes to talking about doing things for posterity, most people are of the humor of this old fellow who grew very peevish when so enjoined and said, we're always doing something for posterity, but I would fain see posterity do something for us. Uh, Addison's joke rises uh, up in a discussion of planting as he urges landowners to plant more trees on their properties. And this attention to woodland depletion, some historians are beginning to say, is where what we now regard as sustainability studies begins. Addison was popularizing the alarm that the increase of forest trees does by no means bear a proportion to the destruction of them, a warning that had been sounded a generation earlier too. And a lot of that concern had to do with England's naval ambitions. By the early 1700s, the construction of a large warship could require two to 3,000 oak trees. Thus Addison's worry that in a few ages the nation may be at a loss to supply itself with timber sufficient for the fleets. So that good husbandry becomes a matter of morality and patriotism. Now, although Addison quips that most people don't want to think about posterity, he and his enlightened contemporaries in England and in Europe seem to be thinking about it all the time and not just in relation to trees. Now, they did not invent <clears throat> the invocation of posterity in literature. Horace, Roman poet, had famously concluded with the claim uh, that he'd built a monument more lasting than brass, a claim that Shakespeare echoes in many of his sonnets, uh, this one in particular. You can see the beginning about the marble and gilded monuments and ends with the conclusion that the poem and the praise, therefore, of the friend will last longer than such monuments, will last, in fact, to the last judgment, which is what the doom means there. And the claim is one we've, this claim about uh, endurance, things lasting beyond the present generation, lasting uh, well into the future, is one we've grown used to making ourselves for art, and art with a capital A, following along with Keats to jump 
to the early 19th century when he says of and to the Grecian urn, that when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe. As the thou shalt remain, rather than the enigmatic final two lines that I want to concentrate on for the moment, thou shalt remain. 18th century invocations of posterity range from the comic to the grave uh, with a fair amount of satiric irony in between. Sometimes writers of the 18th century, which is the period I commute to somewhat regularly, would treat the appeal to posterity ironically. Swift wrote a rambunctious uh, satire early in his career called A Tale of a Tub, and he dedicates it to Prince Posterity, as one might dedicate the work to a noble patron in hopes of being supported, presumably, forever. Swift uses a technique that uh, we're familiar with now through uh, some uh, current comedians and satirists. Stephen Colbert is a good example of impersonating the kind of consciousness that he's attacking. Um, so the, these, this dedication is the work of a fool within that fictional construct. But Swift, in fact, takes the desire to be remembered very seriously and the anxious fear that he might not be comes up in a late work, Verses on the Death of Dr. Swift, where he imagines his own death and reactions to it. Um, he, what part of that poem is a kind of fantasy of oblivion where he um, imagines that a year after his death, someone walks into the London bookseller, best known London bookseller of the day, and asks, do you have any Swift? And the bookseller replies of Swift's books, to fancy they could live a year. I find you're but a stranger here. That's not the way things work now. Um, more self-critically ironic than most writers, Swift turns on his own desire uh, to appeal to posterity for vindication. One of his uh, kind of short maxims is this. It's pleasant to observe how free the present age is in laying taxes on the next. Future ages shall talk of this. This shall be famous to all posterity, whereas their time and thoughts will be taken up about present things as ours are now. Well, we could trace this through uh, other 18th century writers. Uh, Samuel Johnson is uh, a, a good example, Alexander Pope, there are many others. But I want to skip to just one remark from across the channel from Denis Diderot, the editor and moving force of the great encyclopedia, who said that for the artist and the intellectual, the reward is uh, the anticipated judgment of posterity. That's kind of the intellectual's heaven. Um, now, most of his English counterparts were more uh, orthodox in their religious beliefs than Diderot, and they wouldn't have gone quite that far. But it's clear that the uh, idea of posterity as a possible judge, vindication, as something we owe an obligation to, is an extremely important. And we're most familiar with it, probably, uh, in America through the language of the Founding Fathers. And here are just a couple of very quick quotations. This is James Madison on the Revolution, that it should be properly recorded because it holds lessons of which posterity ought not to be deprived. Benjamin Rush, defining patriotism, it comprehends not only the love of our neighbors, but of millions of our fellow creatures, not only of the present, but of future generations. The feisty Sam Adams, if he love wealth better than freedom, this is when the issue is still in doubt, the tranquility of servitude than the animating contest of freedom, go from us in peace. We ask not your counsel or arms. Crouch down and lick the hands that feed you. May your chains sit lightly upon you, and may posterity forget that ye were our countrymen. In a somewhat more stately vein, George Washington, it should be the highest ambition of every American to extend his views beyond himself and to bear in mind that his conduct will affect not only himself and to bear in, not only himself, his country and his immediate posterity, but that its influence may be coextensive with the world and stamp political happiness or misery on ages yet unborn. There you see how one meaning of your own posterity is sliding into the much broader meaning. Now, we could go through um, one, one index, in a way, is, is presidential inaugural speeches closer to our own time and see how posterity gets invoked. Um, it, less and less, I would say, would be the, the kind of short answer. 
But we see a kind of self-consciousness about obligations to the future up through Teddy Roosevelt, who says, if we fail, the cause of self-government throughout the world will rock to its foundations, and therefore our responsibility is heavy to ourselves, to the world as it is today, and to generations yet unborn. And Franklin Roosevelt, and Franklin Roosevelt in his first inaugural, uh, not, in, in, not the second, rather, in 1937 says, our progress out of the Depression is obvious, but that's not what you and I mean by the new order of things. Our pledge was not merely to do a patchwork job with secondhand materials. By using the new materials of social justice, we've undertaken to erect on the old foundations a more enduring structure for the better use of future generations. Now, I'm going to skip a little bit to um, the question of why we seem to have lost the uh, ability to speak as readily about posterity. And part of my explanation comes from Robert Halbreiner. I'm in basic agreement with much of his argument in this book that there was a long progressive period where people could speak optimistically about the future. And then that began to change in the mid 20th century. And I'll say a little bit about what he has to say about why that's the case and what I th why I think it might be too. Um, the uh, ancient past, he says, was unchanging and uh, <laughs> nobody thought the future would be any different and according to this New Yorker cartoon, the past wasn't any different e either. But in the uh, period we think of as the Enlightenment, and you could say earlier, I think probably in the Renaissance, the idea of a you know, secular direction of history becomes somewhat more um, popular and uh, the sense that things are changing. Now, um, this is um, FDR in his last inaugural address. It's very brief. He would die within a few months. And um, I want to just take a moment. Pardon me. Our Constitution of 1787, abandonment of moral principles. It's that last uh, image I'd like to, for us to focus on for a moment, and I'm just going to use simple juxtapositioning here to suggest something about the gulf between uh, that way of conceptualizing uh, a kind of untroubled idea of progress, even though the words are being spoken in a time of great trouble, and uh, our own situation. So we've got the image of the line drawn uh, through the middle of the peaks and valleys. And what it calls to mind for me is this, as you've probably seen versions of a graph like this. Here the peaks and valleys are seasonal variations. This is about rising carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere since 1960. Um, but we could, uh, and that's another image of the same thing. But there are other trend lines like this where upward no longer has quite the same positive meaning. Um, this is a so-called Keeling curve the Great Acceleration, this is where some people would say the Anthropocene really begins with the post-war, great post-war expansion of uh, virtually everything. You can see some of these, what, what the different measures are there, a little clearer in this slide. Um, everything upward, but it's, again, a very different uh, sense of the world. Now, um, what I want to say here is one of the big trend lines that you notice is population. And I want to talk about that for a minute. It's something that people don't like to talk about, and that part of my point today is that that's uh, one of the difficulties we have about 
getting clear about the future. So here's just the, the briefest sort of population history. You can see how long it took uh, for human beings to number one billion, and then how long it took to double that number, and then of course the growth has been uh, very rapid since to about 7.3 uh, billion as we sit here today. Um, <clears throat> And the figure one most often hears looking ahead is somewhere around 9 billion. How are we going to feed 9 billion, Monsanto likes to ask, and so on, uh, whether by mid-century or the end of the century. And that number is used so often that it's often treated as a kind of natural fact. It's not a natural fact. It's an estimate, a projection from the UN, and it's actually a fairly modest projection, and it assumes a continual, continuing decline in fertility rates without that and so it's there the kind of middle one, that's why people like to use it, but you can get higher or uh, inconceivably higher rates uh, if nothing were to change. Now, um, I don't know about you, but I, I can't imagine numbers of the scale we're talking about here, but uh, global population currently increases about 200,000 a day. Uh, there's our stadium empty. There's our stadium times two and a half, which is, would be roughly a rough, rough representation of the number of new earthlings in the world this time tomorrow. Um, I want to try to imagine something, too, about another dimension of our environmental situation. Here's the campus, of course. Uh, you see five Ps there at the bottom. What that stands for is that's a view of the campus prior to the present program for the prevention of parking. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so this is one view, here's another, uh, and here's a third. Our campus is about 1,250 acres. Um, deforestation rates indicate that we lose about 35,000 acres of forest a day, and so that would be the campus times uh, 28. Now, I'm bringing images, not proposed solutions, except this one that I think we need to learn to talk seriously about posterity and that to do so we begin to have to have to bring some of the most basic facts about our species into the light of robust conversation. Uh, the humanities have been good at talking about the achievements of individual humans, but we'll need to think just as deliberately about the achievements of humanity collectively, past, present, future, to talk about those that achievement with equal care. Our imaginings of the future, I'm no expert here and you probably already realize this is not gonna be a talk about science fiction or prediction about trends in, in literature in the future. Our imaginings of the future are primarily apocalyptic these days or post-apocalyptic, post certainly dystopian. The imaginative subject uh, that, that I come across most in reading 21st century works about the environment uh, is some version of the song that Robert Frost imagines for his oven bird. Question that he frames in all but words is what to make of a diminished thing. One very interesting uh, novelist I guess would qualify as perhaps science fiction uh, writer that I happen to know something about, Paolo Bacigalupi. Uh, in his, the novel, the first one, The Wind-Up Girl, set perhaps about a century from now when big agriculture and gene copywriting have gone bad, and getting calories enough is a continual struggle. In that world, most of it's taking place in Bangkok, a character looks at old photographs and resents the subjects for their fat and foolish confidence. In Bacigalupi's more recent novel, The Water Knife, which came out earlier this year, which is about water shortages and water wars in the near future American Southwest, one character imagines, excuse me, wonders what later generations will call their time, speculating that maybe it will be known as the dry time. His partner says, or maybe there won't be anybody. He responds, there will always be survivors, adapters, don't you think? And there's a long pause and she answers, I think the world is very big and we broke it. Now, I don't believe we can blame serious novelists for giving us mostly dystopias in addressing the future. Much as I revere literature, I don't think literature is going to cure our political discourse of its forgetting the future. Remedies are not the artist's responsibility. In one of the novels of the late Chinua Achebe, the great Nigerian novelist, 
Uh, a government official asks, why authors are always pointing to problems rather than solutions? <clears throat> and the writer character answers heatedly, writers don't give prescriptions, they give headaches. That is, they diagnose, they raise submerged truths to the surface where they become more visible. But we also need to consider that apocalyptic scenarios, when they're not just sensational, when they're not just disaster porn, as you know, many movies are, are usually not simple predictions, but warnings. William Blake, a great romantic writer, said that the true prophet is not a fortune teller. He never says such a thing shall happen, let you do what you will. Instead, the honest prophet, biblical or modern, is a seer, not an arbitrary dictator. He says, thus, if you go on, so the result is. Well, I like to think of some of our contemporary fictions as apotropaic apocalypses. Partly, I just like to say that phrase, but an apo apotropaic charm or medicine is something meant to ward off evil. We speak of self-fulfilling prophecies, but surely some contemporary dystopias are meant to be self-defeating prophecies. More directly, to use the title of a poem by a contemporary poet, John Ashbery, there are exercises in saying it to keep it from happening. No, literature alone cannot release us from our tempor temporal claustrophobia, but it has done, and can, what it can do is give us an engagement with the future that has less to, less to do with its explicit content than with its investment in sustainability through its resistance to mere consumption, consumerism, its resistance to the marketplace of disposability and built-in obsolescence. Without some logic other than that of disposability, we cannot take our place, as Pope Francis has eloquently said, as caretakers of our common home and thus the future. Literature is dependent for its materials on all of us. We need to find ways to imagine, to become curators of the future together. I've been trying to suggest that we can only begin to do that by acknowledging our place, looking squarely at our unique place in the history of our species, Homo sapiens sapiens. Or as Jonathan Swift, who defined man not as a rational creature, but a creature capable of reason, might say, Homo sometimes sapiens, it will be our collective educated imagination that will determine whether the Anthropocene era is one of those times. Finally, in terms of our intellectual, artistic, broadly cultural aspirations and labors, I think the answer to the question, what has posterity done for us, is just about everything. Thanks for your attention. Be happy to respond to questions if there are any. Yes? Technology is supposed to sort of help us, you know? It seems in a lot of ways it's making us worse off, you know? Uh, what we're able to do now with the natural environment because of technology. Uh, do you have any thought about that? Yes, I, it, it, I mean, it's certainly both. I think anytime anybody complains about technology, somebody says, well, do you really want to go back 100 years and have surgery without proper anesthesia? And I don't. Um, but I also think that we have tended generally to talk about progress uh, up until fairly recently as if that were an untroubled idea. And I sometimes think there could be an alternative history of technology, um, which might be called, oops, uh, in other words, the subtitle being something about unintended consequences. Um, I mean, it's certainly mixed, and it's part of, I didn't uh, want to take more time to go into Heilbronner's argument, but part of it is that uh, things like kind of uh, mass politics, which has certainly represented progress, and technological progress, that those have at some point stopped seeming like unmixed blessings. And you can say in some cases that the threat of those forces can be as, as, menace, you know, as menacing as, as the benefits might look hopeful. Um, there's no doubt about our, um, just to take climate, I mean, it's really dependent upon carbon, di carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, and those are 
those are byproducts of technology uh, that for the last 300 years or so, we've been extraordinarily good at raising carbon from the ground to the air. And uh, carbon, in, in many cases, something having been there for millions of years. So that, that is certainly technological. That doesn't mean that um, solutions may not be, and in some cases will certainly have to be, technological too. Yes? I do, and for me, that's why uh, I have some place as a professor, not simply as a voting citizen after work, in talking about these issues because you know, people talk about saving the planet. You can say, the well, planet's going to do fine. <laughs> you know, with or without us, the planet does fine. And they talk about saving the species. Probably, under most scenarios, human species survives. Um, but civilization, as we know it, is something a, a lot more fragile, I think, and you point to the, the problems. I think uh, some of the conflicts of uh, emigration, uh, climate, refugees, uh, water wars, and so on, some of those things we see already, and a lot of people think those can only worsen with, without real change. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, do you think the diminished sense of the future is partly connected with an impoverished sense of the past, and that the current generation uh, have kind of been robbed of a feeling of momentum almost, with, with, with all the sort of present tenses and policy and so on? I, I think that's, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, when I say temporal claustrophobia, I really meant to say it's not just that we're not thinking very far ahead, but that we often don't think brave, that the range of reference, you know, and it, when most political discourse, ancient history is what happened 10 years ago, and, and a long-term vision would be a five-year plan or something like that, and that is a real constriction. And as you say, it's often more presentist than, than that. Uh, Edmund Burke says somewhere, well, he says near the end of his life in the re Reflections on the French Revolution that the person will not care about posterity who doesn't care about his ancestors. And I th so for me, focusing uh, perhaps more of our attention, uh, our, in this case, I mean faculty and universities and so on, on the future doesn't mean that we stop teaching Socrates or the past or so on, that there's real reciprocity there. But I do think that, that we need to demand more of people in, in, in power, whether in politi political realm or business or wherever it is, people who are talking about, well, what does that mean? You know, what, what does that mean five years, 10 years, 20 years hence? And if the answer is that, I don't know, it's, you know, then it becomes another kind of disposable razor or something that we're encouraged to buy and with, without any thought about where, that's, where that can lead. See? John. I wonder if you could just reflect a little bit on the strong political opposition to addressing some of the issues that you talked about today, particularly in the United States. Uh, and in the Congress and in the Senate. It seems that that opposition is in the minority throughout you know, in the world. And I'm just wondering if you had, if you thought about uh, why that opposition is so pitched uh, and what, you know, what, what motivates that resistance to the kinds of things you're talking about. That's a good question, a big one. I mean, all sorts of things. I think it's easy to be kind of cynical and say, well, somebody's paycheck or you know, where their, their campaign contributions are coming from. Um, and um, not that I want to discard cynicism. <laughs> I, I, I sometimes think, I think it's Lily Tomlin who said, uh, I try to be cynical, but it's hard to keep up. You know, it's like, uh, it's a continual challenge. 
Um, there is a, a lot of it has to do with fear of regulation. Once you get past the economics, you know, this is going to hurt my pocketbook in some way. And that you hear that, that seems to be a lot stronger in American political discourse than in some of the European discourse. We're not alone, but we're certainly it's much more marked here that, is, you know, that it's a partisan issue about whether climate change is real. That's not true, as I understand it, in most countries. You certainly get partisan divides about, well, what's that mean? What to do? Should we act? Or, you know, should somebody else be acting? And so on. But the, uh, the sort of facts of the science. And the only way I can explain it to me, and it's, it's probably too crude, but I've heard you know, one intelligent f philosophical ethicist put it this way. Well, you're in this situation, if you accept this, this, and this, then you've got to do something. And if you really don't want to do something, then you work backwards and say that, that, and that aren't true. Um, I mean, it, that, that leaves out a lot of nuance. But, but it is, uh, regulation is what you hear most, I think, if you push very hard on opposition to, and, and fear of world government. You know, that the, the people who are, uh, want to do something about climate really want to give more power to the United Nations or international bodies. And that seems to be... A, something we in America worry about more than some, some other countries do. I also think, I mean, there is the obvious fact that we, we are a major player in this in terms of we've been more successful than most people about putting, getting carbon from the ground and putting it into the air. So there's the, the feeling that it may have certainly have more long-term effect on our life than others. Or that we're not as vulnerable, perhaps, too. Yes? Um, it's interesting to think about in the, in the realm of sustainability because it requires a kind of ethical reflection beyond the technological side of sustainability and you know it seems like we've acknowledged that maybe technology has failed us in some ways and thinking about posterity especially in the hope for instance is thinking about sustainability opens up sustainability to a wider field or a wider audience who may not find the science that they might find to their own so my question is, are you optimistic that uh, his recent uh, publications and his lobbying efforts in the United States might shift actual public belief? Yes, guard guardedly so. <laughs> um, I, I do think it's uh, that, that a lot of winds are blowing and that, that it couldn't come at a better time. Um, I think the encyclical is very eloquent. It doesn't say there are some areas it doesn't stress in the way I would, you know, would like to see stressed, but population being one, it's not mentioned. That's not, that doesn't startle me, but I, you know, I think it's an important part of the discussion. But I think it's a wonderful statement and uh, critique. It's not, as you know, it's made a lot of people angry too. Um, but I think it, all in all, yes, that it advances the conversation. And the most recent development, I don't know the details of it, but that China has announced is going to cap and trade, that's huge. Uh, and that could mean that the Paris talks this coming year really can make some progress. Um, it certainly eliminates one of the obstacles here to getting people motivated, saying, well, would, you know, if whatever we do, China's still putting more into the air than we are, so let's wait and see. Um, so yeah, I, I am. Somebody I've read says we shouldn't use the terms pessimistic and optimistic, but we should, but hopeful is okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm hopeful. Yes? You know, I thought it was interesting the, um, the, uh, the slide we had about the population trends, and we had like the variations of like, you know, continuous uh, right. rate, and you also had one of like the replacement rate, and then the, the third or fourth one was, you know, low replacement rate. Right. If you follow the, um, you know, like people kind of advocate that, you know, the population is growing too fast or too much, you would just have, you know, just as many people who say we shouldn't be replacing, not even the replacement rate is good enough. But if you follow those trajectories and extrapolate out, you see that you'll have no posterity to, you know, to, to you know, move toward or to, if, if, if it kind of you know, continues to go at that rate. Mm -hmm. And you look, I mean, look at like see what happens in China, where they they try to control how people, you know, they, they've sort of like gone against the idea that people are a good thing in China, 
And look what it leads to. It leads to like, you know, you know government um, promoting abortion and to like all sorts of violence on every level. And people are still not happy with the material, the material wealth that, you know, that at least certain strata of, of Chinese population have. So I'm just wondering what, I mean, how can you, I mean, what should we be, be doing to kind of become control people's um, fertility, at least not by the state? Um, but how do we, I mean, how do you, you know, sustain the environment and, you know, welcome people and not have it, um, you know, and, and have posterity, have people to, you know, you know to be living, you know. Right, right. Well, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, well, <clears throat> I don't think that's a problem. <laughs> I mean, I, I understand what you mean about trends. You could imagine certain trends if, if extended out forever, but that uh, population is going to increase, and the question is how fast or maybe stabilize. Um, now, I don't, you know, I don't want to pretend to be a seer or to be flippant about this, but I think in, in most areas of the world, it's still increasing pretty rapidly, and those trends that you see uh, depend on things like education and, and women's rights and uh, access to family planning and so on. So that there, one estimate I've seen, and this, there's a lot of guesswork here, is the population increases now about 80 million a year globally. And independently, another organization that's involved in family planning estimates, independent of that figure, the number of women who don't have access to information about birth control, family planning, is about 80 million. <laughs> now, or the number, I, sh I shouldn't say that, that's not the right way to put it, the number of unintended pregnancies. I don't know how good that science is, but it would seem to me that that's, you know, if, if one is really trying to stabilize, that's where you would start. Um, sometimes in discussions of <laughs> uh, the issue of uh, population stabilization comes up, you know, people immediately think about their own families. Uh, well, I'm, I'm the seventh of eight children, so I have a certain ambivalence, you know, immediately, instinctively when somebody talks about birth control. On the other hand, I don't know anybody who talks about birth control being retroactive. You know, I mean, this is uh, that, that we're, we're trying to, to figure out how we, can, how we can make a sustainable world. And I say a lot of people don't want to talk about population, and that includes a lot of environmentalists. And it's because of religious reasons, or the, its, its political associations in the past have often had to do with a, a very unpleasant kind of classism or nationalism. One country saying those people over there shouldn't be reproducing like rabbits. Um, or um, uh, for, as I said, for, for uh, religious reasons, or just the feeling that it's a political third rail. My own feeling, and this is certainly a minority view, but that it's, it's a kind of elephant in the living room. And until we're able to talk about it like grown-ups, whatever we decide in various countries and collectively we want to do, that there's a whole area of the future we just can't think about. It's like a, like a psychological repression. That's kind of the way I feel. Now, there's some, sometimes people worry about underpopulation locally. And I think you know, they worry about declining birth rates like in Western Europe or in Japan, you get aging populations. My book, the cure for that is immigration, but that's uh, this is not that's another uh, you know another long topic. <laughs> so, probably time to get out in that beautiful day. Thank you all. Thanks very much. Thanks for that.